As Rufa said, thank you, Tony, and thank you for being here today. I'm sure your morning is normally much busier and involved in lots of other things than talking with people like us. So, touching on what Rufa said, it has only been a few months since you've been at The Sun, since September. How have those first few months been? How have They've you found it? By. They've flown <laughs> by. It feels like I've been there for only uh, a, a few minutes. Um, it, um, every day presents a, a new crisis, and we find new ways of screwing ourselves every day. So <laughs> it's, um, it's very challenging, but very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Good. And I guess diving in again on the new... As we've said, the Telegraph and the expensive scandal was a kind of standout piece of investigative journalism. In your few months at The Sun, is there any particular story that is you're proud of and that you've done as a, a paper? Um, there's nothing... I mean, uh, the trouble with MP's expenses is that it was the story of a generation and, um, and it was a wonderful story to, uh, to be part of, but it, it, it tends to make everything else, you know, pale into insignificance. Um, but I suppose just a few to... To mention, really, um, we exposed Age UK for you know ripping off uh, old folks by diverting them to more expensive power deals. Uh, we led the way in predicting that eventually that Michael Gove and Boris Johnson would come for the out campaign. Um, we have documented more fully and first uh, the Chris Evans debacle on Top Gear. We were first to note that Prince William seemed to be doing no work whatsoever, which has now become a sort of uh, a trope for a number of media companies. But there's no one, one standout thing. It's just been a roller coaster. Lots of them. And culturally, you've, you know, as a media world, we'd like to put things into some nice little boxes and we like to kind of talk about the newspapers as qualities and mid-markets and red tops. How different is it as an editor, having been at all three? I mean, to be candid, it's, it's the similarities that are most striking. And probably 80% of what I do every day would fit very comfortably into the Daily Mail and would fit very comfortably into the Daily Telegraph. Uh, the, the key difference, I suppose, at The Sun is um, the, high, um, the high propensity for humour, um, the amount of irreverence, um, the high premium that's placed upon exclusive stories, and uh, also the emphasis on the Sun community. So um, you know, the Sun readership of between five and six million. Um, but I had no idea until I got there, for instance, that we were you know, among the leading short break operators in Britain. And four million Sun readers have gone on holidays, courtesy of us, over the past five years. So th those are probably the key differences I would itemise. OK, because you, you mentioned their kind of fun and frivolity. Mm -hmm. Would they be key words to describe the sort of Sun's brand personality? I think so. I mean, uh, we, you know, we want to take no prisoners every day in the way that we go about things. Um, uh, you know, no, no friends, no fear or favour, cover everything with uh, equal ferocity. Um, I think it's important to retain a sense of humour when you're trying to uh, report grim news. But that doesn't stop us doing serious things properly as well. We should be comprehensive. And we should be across the waterfront, I think, in a way that the best newspapers are, which is why I come back to the point that probably, I'd say, 80% of what we do winds up in the, in the Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph every day. We just might treat it slightly differently and with a little bit less respect. And that's so... I guess, got to dive in here, haven't we? I'm sure it's a question on most people's lips. The paywall. Not just been written about paywalls up, down, good or bad. Yeah, I, you don't I, have one now. I, I, don't, I don't really take the view these things are good or bad. I, I think we need to realise that in the digital landscape we are going to be trying a number of things over the next few years, some of which will work and some of which will not work. It was um, obvious to me and to Rebecca Brooks when she returned to the company um, that the, the paywall wasn't the success that the company had anticipated. They had um, a small band of uh, very loyal people who were willing to commit to it, but the company decided that it wanted to achieve scale. So as a result of that, it was decided that the paywall had to come down. Um, the website is being uh, redesigned, and uh, that will uh, happen over the next uh, month or two. And we need to ensure that the, the Sun brand is distributed as widely as possible. So we'll be appearing on Snapchat Discover within the next um, month or two, and we'll be looking to extend the stun, Sun brand into other areas, into the bargain. Which is actually, I mean, outside of Snapchat, I mean... What are kind of ambitions for the Sun as a title? Well, one of the biggest things that we're going to be doing this year isn't really editorial at all, but um, the company has high hopes for um, launching Sun Bets, which is um, hoping to go live around the time of the uh, launch of the new Premier League season in August. 
Um, uh, there are 14 million people that uh, bet um, in the UK. Uh, about 55% of them are regular sun readers. And we think that's a very lucrative market for us. And it's one of the areas that we're keen to expand in from uh, the autumn onwards. We've um, formed a partnership with Tabcor, the biggest bookmaker in Australia. And an awful lot of work is going on at News UK to ensure that's going to be a big success. So you're thinking, as well as sort of being a, a tour operator and taking lots of people on holiday, that you could be rivaling Paddy Power? We'll be a gambler into the bargain. <laughs> and, uh, look, I think the, the, the future for you know, news brands is going to be um, a variety of revenue streams. And it's not just going to be cover price any more than it's going to be uh, advertising. Um, we need, to, if we're to have a long term future, I think we all need to. Um, as Catherine Viner uh, highlighted, all need to um, uh, look to our strengths and see that there are areas we can play in where we can be successful for a long-term sustainable future. Cool. A question that's kind of saying, you know, news operates around the clock, which I think is ironic. News has always happened around the clock. I think the big difference now is, is mm. that we have platforms that are, allow <coughs> us to, to seek news out, see it and everything like that. Your day has got to be quite different now than it was even five years ago. I think so. I mean, the, you know, the prevalence of social media means that you're probably you know, always on and um, the likes of you know, Twitter providing a sort of running news commentary means there's never any point in you know, waiting for the thing actually to appear in print. But I suppose my day hasn't fundamentally changed. You know, you're up at around six and it's the Today programme and Nick Ferrari um, and it probably finishes by you know, checking in at about 11 o'clock to find out what's on everybody else's front page, what's inside and we're very aggressive at night. We try and change a lot so uh, that we ensure we've got the best of what we decided were the best stories of the day at you know, nine o'clock and that we've got the best of our rivals so that by the paper that you get in London the following morning should um, comprehensively cover everything from the Financial Times to the Daily Star. And on that, um, we touched on social media and, you know, as Rika said, apparently a prevalent social media person. Where, how does that fit into the role of a kind of modern newsroom for you? I think most people now are attuned to... Um, I mean, for, for us, probably the most important social network is Facebook. You know, there's evidence that people come via Facebook and spend a great length of time um, um, uh, reading your, your story. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, Facebook in instant articles. A lot of time and thought has equally gone into Snapchat, and we think that the uh, irreverence that we bring to the party will be perfect for uh, Snapchat Discover. Um, most uh, reporters are now on Twitter in some format or other, although I've noticed myself over the past couple of years that it's probably changed um, from being... Um, a driver of traffic to uh, essentially a, a keen competitor for the likes of the Press Association, and people now use it as a news source. But I'm not sure it's a, a massive traffic driver unless you're the likes of Jeremy Clarkson or, or Piers Morgan. Um, and if anything, I, I think there's a tendency for some social media forms, particularly Twitter more than others, to become a bit of an echo chamber with groupthink persisting and everybody deciding that something is terrible or something that's wonderful and it's led to a loss of independent thought among some journalists, I think. And with the likes of people like Jeremy Clarkson and, and Piers Morgan, is it sort of driving their personal brand more than I think so. Else? I mean, the, the people that seem to be making a great success out of Twitter are massive personalities like those two or um, sports reporters and I think that's a reflection of the way probably that sports reporting has changed phenomenally over the past five years. Nobody wants to wait for the printed version of a football match report anymore. They want an on-the-whistle report or they want minute-by-minute -minute analysis, second-by-second -second analysis or a front page of the programme, which is why um, a, a lot of the best sports reporters now have got you know, social media followings, seven-figure social media followings. But even actually within the realm of sports, I think as, as a form of news, it's always been a really interesting area that people still will... You know, have been at a game themselves, watched it all, mm -hmm. seen it firsthand, but then are still hungry to hear what the reporters have to say, still hungry to, to read the next day's report. Uh, they are, but I think, um, I, I mean, to, to continue the sports reporting analogy, I think the quality of what people can provide now in, in print day after has uh, gone up exponentially. The amount of data that exists and the use of statistics for those that follow sport closely means it's not enough now to know that 
you know, Arsenal got beaten uh, 2-0 by Barcelona, but you, uh, you know, people that are keen on the sport will know that Barcelona forwards exchanged 60 passes and Sergio Busquets ran twice as fast, far as Mesut Ozil um, and there were more goal line clearances by Petr Cech. So uh, that data has really allowed sports reporting to become deeper and more meaningful and therefore more engaging, I think, to readers today. And actually data, here's another word I can pick up on there, because data is something that, again, in the industry we all talk about a lot. Data is driving so much of our insights, so much of how we place advertising. How do you, within a newsroom, balance the kind of the print journalism and the digital journalism and your use of data within that? I, I don't really... I mean, of, of course, you know, data is very much driving what we're doing digitally. Uh, I would say it probably isn't driving so much of what we do um, in... in in print terms, much of that, I think, is much more instinctive. We have in mind who the Sun Reader is, and we're writing for the Sun Reader. So it's somebody average age, 49, certain amount of income, probably married, probably children, maybe a mortgage, some savings, holidays three times a year. We'll watch uh, I'm a Celebrity. We'll watch Match of the Day. Most of them probably have Sky. So we keep those people in mind from a print point of view. Digitally, we're obviously driven much more by data because we know in real time what it is that people are coming to read, and we can provide a great deal more of that. They come to look for some slightly different things digitally. But I don't really see, to come back to your original question, I'm not sure that I see it is a binary choice. How much time do I spend mm -hmm. thinking about print journalism? How much time do I spend thinking about digital journalism? The model, I think, for most newsrooms must be to think about both instinctively and recognise that you've got an audience that might pick up the paper, hopefully will pick up the paper and spend half an hour a day with you, but some of that audience will be online during the day and will want to know what's going on before they go to a football match or want to know what's happened after Prime Minister's Question Time or um, you know, during a big you know, cultural TV event and so forth. And they won't wait for print and you have to serve both of that so I think it's important to not have that binary choice but for the best reporters to realize that they're operating across all platforms yeah I mean I think we see that from the audience data that the guys have talked about earlier is, is that people do we all just instinctively move between platforms yeah. these days and, and don't even think about it no. anymore so changing tack slightly I think Ruth has touched on this as well your your time at Morrow which I'm, I have to say, I'm a little bit envious of. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, if anybody, if you've not been, go. It's a fantastic Spanish restaurant in Clerkenwell, and um, I was lucky enough to spend um, a, a couple of months there while I was on um, hiatus, and it was a really interesting learning experience. I mean, people were very, um, to my disappointment, people were very patronising about the idea of of working in a restaurant. For a kickoff, people thought that you know this must be a terrible career choice on my part, rather than something that I was doing temporarily. And that was um, uh, underlain, I think, by the knowledge that, or the sense that people had that you know, if you worked in a restaurant, you were probably uneducated and, um, and rather dim. But actually, you know, the, the caliber of people that I worked with in that restaurant, would, they would hold up very well in a newsroom. Most people had degrees. Um, most people were very, uh, very on it, multilingual. Um, and indeed, there was, I felt there was something that you know, journalists could probably learn from the restaurant mm. trade in that um, a lot of journalists, I think, have become consumed with the idea that they're part of a profession and that some, in some sense they're part of an academic discipline. And I think that's really wrong and really unhealthy. It's a trade and you, you learn it by practising it. And the idea that it's a profession um, held to the same standards as doctors and accountants is something that's grown up over the past 20 years and I think it should be resisted. You become a better journalist by practising it, not by being in a classroom. So would you advise a kind of a budding young journalist, a wannabe journalist, to sort of maybe get out there and experience something else, works in another industry to... Uh, I would say that it shouldn't be something that you, could come, you should necessarily come to via a classroom. And I think it's one of the, one of the mistakes that the, the media industry the new, the, has made over the past 20 years is, is that it's become the kind of discipline and that, for which it's imperative to have a degree and then a postgraduate MA mm -hmm. in journalism. And I think it's a shame that we seem to have cut off that route of people coming into the trade at the age of 18 via schools without necessarily going into the third tier of education. It's something we're looking at very closely at News UK because if you're not reflective of your, of your audience, you quickly grow apart from it, I think. I think it's probably reflected across some of our businesses as well that we have all rather got into the habit that, you know, if someone hasn't got a degree, then we're not certain we want to look at them. Quite. Whereas there are other experiences out there. Before I maybe ask a couple of questions from the, the audience, um, so if, get thinking caps on now if you've got any of those. Um, can you imagine 
restoring an element of paid content back? Because we talked paywall, but going back on that oh, I would never say never. I think within the company, and we've got some you know, paid elements of what we do. So um, more than a million people pay to uh, play Dream Team, our fantasy football game, which is very successful. And I can't see that becoming a completely free phenomenon um, anytime soon. I, I, I think f for now, the, the, the paywall is down. I don't really see any future for us going behind all of that. I think you never say never because I think the, the lesson of the paywall, or one of the lessons of the paywall, indeed, you know, the lessons that we should all take is that we should learn to fail at things and fail fast and then move on and try new things. So although we're launching on Snapchat Discover, if it's not working, I would advise binning it in a couple of years and not persisting with something that isn't necessary. We think it will work, I'm very confident, <laughs> but if any of these things don't work, don't persist with them for years. We're all finding our way digitally. And I think it behoves us to so show some humility about what works and what doesn't work in the future as our readers navigate accordingly. It is interesting. I think that's an area that we tend to applaud some of the newcomers into the market, so whether it's not always Google and Facebook, some of the digital players who do, we kind of applaud them for trying and failing and mm. moving on quite quickly and are quite critical of our own industry mm. and kind of pour over it quite a lot and mm. kind of go all wise and whatever. Whereas I think it's important that we do the same. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, the, the lesson of those new brands is that we need to be more nimble and more agile about what it is that we, uh, we do because the quality of what we do, I think, is unparalleled and it's a very rich time for journalism. I'd like to echo Catherine Viner in that. In many ways, it's a better time for journalism than it's ever been. And it's a, I would argue, though, that although you have these new brands arriving, the reliance on the traditional news media is um, as important as, as ever. And I think it's beyond dispute that newspapers continue to drive that national conversation in as much as they decide what stories are and they broadcasters then tend to jump to their tune. I'm, I, I never see something on the 6 o'clock or 10 o'clock news that I don't already... I mean, I'm genuinely startled when I see something on the BBC that I'm unaware of. I can only think of probably one example in the past eight or nine months where I've turned on the BBC News of an evening and thought, my God, they've got a story that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of. And it tends to be the printed media that is responsible for, set, mm. for setting the terms of the debate and deciding what, what stories are. And I don't think the, the new brands have yet managed to colonise that space. Which is good. So should we bravely see if we've got any questions from the floor here? Why not? <laughs> one there. Gentleman down here in the... Yeah. Jamie Donald from Toast Media. Um, audiences, the newsroom, and advertisers all input and benefit from news brands. Do you think there's a sort of a power shift changing at the moment in terms of audience and their power over news brands? Can you, sorry, can you be specific? Yeah, so whereas before newsrooms would sort of, uh, by and large, dictate what happens and advertisers would have more of an input, do you think uh, you guys are having to think about the audiences a bit more and your readers a little bit more than you have done historically? Um, I can't speak for my, my predecessors. I'd be really surprised if your previous editors weren't thinking about their audiences all the time. I mean, one of the first things I did when I got to The Sun was I had an instinct of what you know, The Sun reader was, but I was very keen to um, uh, put my suspicions to the test, and I had a very detailed piece of work done on exactly who the uh, average Sun reader was and the segments that they were and what it was that they did with their... Uh, work time, their leisure time, where they spent their money and so forth, because I was, uh, had very strong ideas about the way in which I wanted to uh, take the paper. But I did, certainly didn't want to take it too far away from the uh, readers. And happily, my own instincts about who the readers were were, were backed up by the, the research that we did. I think any news organisation that looks to stray away from its readers and, and decide that it wants to write for itself rather than for its uh, readership is on the road to ruin. Any more but one there. Can we go just gentlemen just up here? <coughs> Camilla, can you? Yep. Thanks. Alia Sam. I assume uh, print is still quite an important part of your publishing activities. Have you looked into how new technology can help you measure a user's engagement with the print, or is it still a guessing game where you use uh, surveys well after the event? Uh, I mean, I think that's a question that I should... I, I, I can't pretend to have much knowledge of that, but, uh, you know, we've got a big business development department at News UK that might be able to better answer that rather than me um, attempting to, um, uh, to busk it and give you an answer that is, um, uh, that's unsatisfactory. I mean, all I can tell you with certainty is that 
you know, the average reader is with the paper for about half an hour a day, 30 to 35 minutes a day. Um, and um, I was very heartened by what Bob Hoffman had to say earlier about um, the, uh, the <coughs> relative ineffectiveness of the, uh, the digital revolution from the point of view of advertising. We've got Ray just here. Ray's not a journalist. Tony, uh, to what extent will you be free to decide uh, to take the sun for, in, or out of the EU? And if you have that freedom, how are you likely to exercise it? Um, Ray, you've probably not been paying attention. Um, we <laughs> have written, um, the last time I counted, about 55 editorials on Europe since I arrived on the 14th of September. And the tone of them is uh, extremely sceptical. Um, does that mean that we're going to campaign for Brexit? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't quite decided yet. But the tone of the, uh, the coverage is undoubtedly pretty hostile to what David Cameron um, has delivered. And interestingly, to come back to the earlier question, that was in large part um, guided by um, the readers. One of the first things that we did when I got there was we carried out a detailed audit of reader attitudes to Europe. And we found that the readership was pretty hostile to the European project. And that's guided some of our thinking and, um, editorially in terms of how we're... Uh, covering the, uh, the European vote. I've got a couple more questions here, some of which came from the audience earlier. So the first one I'll go with, um, which no one's asked yet, is um, a new paper launched yesterday. Yes, very exciting. Is that a good thing I for think the it's market? Look, I think it's bound to be a good thing. I mean, uh, you, you know, uh, and it behoves all of us to, um, to welcome uh, yeah, a new entrant to the market. It's always exciting to see new types of journalism and new ways of, of reaching an audience, and I commend them for doing it, and um, I, I really hope it's a success. Um, I, I noticed that the reaction to it yesterday was really mixed, and there was a great deal of hostility to it. And I remember exactly the same reaction um, very prominently to the launch of Metro in 2004 5. And it's rubbish, it's an amalgam of PA, what a waste of time and money. Associated newspapers should be embarrassed. And of course, it went on to be a sore away success. So I think we should have some humility about whether we think the thing is going to be a success or die on its backside in, in a few years. Uh, I, I won't lie, I think it's a challenge to expect people to pay uh, 50 pence for it um, and in an extremely competitive newspaper market I think that's going to be hard but I wish them every success I think it's really nice that we've got a new paper just as another one is dying at the end of this month. Totally agree. Um, we had Tony speak at our very first shift and we managed to persuade you to come back three years later so if we do so again in a couple of years time which is terrible to try and ask someone to predict and put them on the spot. But what do you think the achievements you will have hoped to have done with the sun? Oh, look, I'm just a, you know, I'm a custodian of the, of the paper and its values. I just need to be ensuring that I live up to those and that we're central to national conversation and that we're as vital and as irreverent and as pulsating uh, then as we are now. That would be my sincere hope. Um, but predictions after that, beyond that, would be... Folly on my part. They are terrible. Say. Like all those people who predicted that Metro would never survive. Quite. We were getting stuff. I saw there was one more question back over here. Um, your expenses uh, scandal, uh, MP expenses scandal that you uncovered, presumably <laughs> took a fair... Yeah, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry, not your personal yeah. expenses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 presumably took a fair amount of resource uh, to achieve. Uh, and as newspapers seem to be cutting back in some ways on their editorial budgets, is there a danger that we won't see that sort of journalism for much longer? Uh, I mean, it's a really good question. And, and I think there is a, there's a real danger of that happening. I mean, one of the things I really want to do at The Sun is get, you know, get proper investigations going in a very detailed way. And the point you make is a, is a very good one. They're really expensive. They're very time consuming. They're very difficult to execute. They're legally very, very fraught. I get nothing. I get time consuming, wasteful letters from one firm of London lawyers almost every day. 
So the ability to prosecute an investigation and do it really, really well is very, very hard. But it's one of the things that marks out national newspapers. And it's one of the things that the, the new entrants to the market, the digital kids on the block, have, have yet to even come close to achieving, I think. And really good investigations remain the province of newspapers, um, whether it's um, what Catherine Viner was talking about earlier. My previous newspaper, the Daily Mail, has set up an investigations unit. The Sunday Times has a noble tradition of it. Uh, MPs' expenses took months and dozens of people. And it's the established players, I think, that are going to going to continue to blaze that kind of trail. And I think, I, I can't speak for other editors, but I suspect most of them would want to try and cherish the idea of investigations because they know that in a world of endless news and utility, they should be looking for points of difference. And investigations executed well and those that make a difference can really make a difference to a news brand. Got time for one more question just here. There's a clock splashing at us. Hello. Uh, Ian Dowds at UCOM. Um, one of the themes that I've picked up, I think I picked up from uh, Steve Richards earlier and, and Catherine Viner was uh, digital being about live news and print being about analysis and in-depth analysis. Uh, am I right to pick that up? And is the same true for The Sun as it would be for The Guardian or The Times in making that division? I, I don't think there's a binary choice and uh, I think there's an assumption because we are a media class and because we are London centric that um, everybody's on all the time and that they are aware of news all the time and therefore we need to only go down the road of analysis. Um, um, another organisation that I worked for previously, we, we, did some, uh, we did some work and we discovered that barely 65% of the readership had broadband. And you know, this, was a, this was an organisation that was forever writing about Facebook and Apple and BuzzFeed and Twitter, etc. And it was really salutary that nearly half the audience didn't even, didn't even have broadband at home. So I think there's a danger of us thinking that we uh, need to have that binary choice, that you know, the print is only going to be uh, analysis. I'm sure, of course, you can do more of that um, uh, the day after, but I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which when people pick up a newspaper, things are brand new to them. And especially if you've got a deeply embedded exclusive culture, those things are going to be especially new to them, and they won't have found those you know, online in the, uh, in the previous day. Brilliant. Tony, thank you. Thank you very much for all of your time. Um, join me in thanking thank Tony before we hand over to you. <laughs>